Hello, my name is Linda Gale Becker. I'm from the Desmond Tutu HIV Center. And today I'll be talking about the prevention pipeline and the implications uh, for clinical trial design. And so we'll be really discussing how the prevention pipeline has, has become far more diverse and exciting and how that in turn has had an impact on the standard of prevention and how we design efficacy trials today and in the future. So it's more than a decade ago now that we learned that antiretroviral based PrEP provides robust protection against HIV in all populations. And this really has revolutionized HIV, although our scale-up uh, still needs to occur. I'm very glad that we have moved beyond this standard of prevention, and um, it uh, really is in this context that we conducted a number of the efficacy uh, clinical trials in the past, but now uh, increasingly have a much richer diversity of prevention modalities on hand, and of course PrEP is key among them. In the last decade, even PrEP has gone on to further diversify and a very exciting current and future array of pre-exposure prophylaxis options, all of them having uh, come through a robust and uh, dependable solid uh, clinical research um, uh, development pathway. So thanks again to AVAC for the great pro, uh, pictures. This describes what has been up until PrEP at the currently available standard of prevention, which has formed the placebo arm in many of the efficacy trials. Of course, those efficacy trials listed here have been key in the development of oral daily FTDF, uh, which really is the mainstay of daily oral PrEP. Um, and we know from these clinical trials in a variety of different populations that when adherence to FTDF is high on a daily basis, then protection also is consistently high. Moving along from there, there have been other antiretrovirals tested. And of course, here FTAF it plays an important role. And in uh, development of FTAF as oral PrEP, what was required was a bioequivalence type study and non-inferiority comparing FTAF to FTDF. And this was shown in the DISCOVER trial, uh, whilst also, of course, providing better PK and fewer side effects. This has been shown, therefore, to be an alternative for cisgender MSM and transgender women, although not yet available for women. And quoting the late Gita Ramji, who said in 2018, we have not shifted HIV incidence for young women and girls in more than 20 years. And that sad fact remains um, and really urges us to go on to look for newer uh, alternative modalities. And Charles will be talking about this in the next talk, but it does introduce the need for less frequent and alternative dosing prevention options. But without doubt, our standard of prevention now does include oral daily PrEP. And this is really critical as moving forward our primary prevention uh, opportunities. Before it became uh, the really cemented in as the part of the standard of prevention. These two clinical trials, however, were able to be conducted. And so were conducted as placebo controlled, double blind randomized controlled trials of the depivirine vaginal ring, a topical PrEP agent, uh, which showed a 30% reduction in HIV in women and girls in Eastern and Southern Africa, and in the open label form, uh, showing effectiveness with a risk reduction of 0.5. Um, the standard of prevention increasingly bringing on a tenofovir uh, if, uh, FTC as oral PrEP will have an impact on how we conduct HIV vaccine trials as well. And here I want to draw your attention to a great talk from Peter Gilbert in the Global Vaccine Enterprise Workshop uh, 
series uh, now available also online, where he, together with Holly Janes, have described how HIV vaccine trials would look in the future. As long as we don't have a licensed product, we will be able to conduct uh, placebo controlled trials, although obviously with an improving standard of care, these trials will need to increase in number in order to make sure that we obtain the power required. And uh, as I will discuss in a moment, we may be able to recruit populations who could struggle with oral daily PrEP as, as a prevention modality. Even if uh, vaccines are found to be partially effective, we may still be able to um, use placebo control as long as none are licensed. Once we have a licensed product, however, it is their prediction that we are going to rely more heavily on correlates of protection or immune biomarkers in order to design the trials. So what has been the impact to date of the evolving standard of prevention? Well, here we turn to uh, vaccine trials that have just recently ended or are currently in, in, uh, in the field. And the ad 26 j, &J program is uh, one such program. So recently, unfortunately, the Imbacordo, the ad 26 vaccine uh, trial in young women and girls uh, came to an early end. But what I can tell you is in that placebo control trial, PrEP was introduced as part of the standard of prevention uh, midway, and women were encouraged to use PrEP um, as part of their prevention modality. Mosaico is the brother part of that study and is currently ongoing, slightly different vaccine regimen, um, and in a different population, the study is ongoing. But here, the recruitment was offered to people who may have some ambivalence about oral PrEP. Um, although, of course, ethically, oral PrEP still needs to be part of the standard of prevention and available to the cohort. What has been the impact on the broadly neutralizing antibody trials? And here, two trials recently ended known as the AMP studies. They have now read out and importantly showed proof of concept of a monoclonal antibody, in this case VRCO1, to prevent HIV infection. The study showed importantly that it is very important that VRCO1 or the monoclonal antibody matches the circulating virus. And unfortunately, too few uh, were a match in the, these trials uh, to show overall efficacy. But it, an important um, proof of concept, again, here, the trial design was had the placebo control, but PrEP was encouraged in the standard of prevention. It is going to be important, though, that this biomarker of an antibody threshold is used in designing the efficacy trials of all of these wonderful new monoclonal antibodies that are in phase one and phase two, either as on their own or in combination as we move them forward into efficacy trials. The first trial that really, um, I think, was impacted by the onset of oral PrEP as a, as a real prevention modality was this cabotegravir long-acting. It's a STAN transfer integrase. Charles will be speaking more about it in a moment. But just to say, here for the first time, uh, the design had to be a double-blind, double-dummy with uh, the active arm of FTDF compared with an active arm of cab -LA. And the design was to show non-inferiority of the cab -LA. in fact, showing in the main study superiority of cab -LA. Similarly, in HPTN084, in women and, and young uh, adolescent girls, uh, Amazingly, an 89% reduction in HIV in the Cabalet arm, but also for the first time seeing quite impressive reductions in HIV, even in the FTDF arm in this uh, young woman and girl study. So for the first time, I think showing that PrEP overall, it can have an impact on background uh, incidents in, in these populations. So both depivirine vaginal ring and long-acting injectables now in the pending regulatory review stage. 
Um, and so, of course, now being added in, in the near future to the standard of prevention and will have an impact on new clinical trials um, down the line. There are other ways, of course, of uh, skinning this uh, fish, if you like. And here, the, the PrepVac consortium is to be congratulated on a very innovative design. So combining PrEP with vaccines, you see uh, a vaccine trial that is compared with uh, placebo and a PrEP component as a lead-in where one PrEP agent is compared with another PrEP agent. This uh, trial, which I think is underway and, and uh, brings a, a real element of innovation, adds a second component of innovation, which is this notion of the registrational cohort or a run-in uh, uh, cohort, which allows, first of all, a pool of ready participants, but also allows to measure pre-trial incidents as a, as a comparator. Uh, for the trial as it unfolds. This kind of concept is being used in the next set of PrEP agents being tested. So here is the monthly pill for HIV prevention is Latrovir. Um, and these are in two ongoing phase three studies, Empower 022 in cisgender women and Empower 024 in cisgender men who have sex with men and transgender women. First of all, looking at the woman's study, here a run-in uh, screening time is uh, allowing a, an assessment of recency or incidence um, in order to uh, contribute to the understanding of efficacy in the trial. So two active arms, one if TDF, the other is Latrovia monthly, and here the primary outcome is safety and incidence of one compared to the other. The secondary outcome is, is Latrovia versus background incidence. So how are we assessing that? That we are using a biomarker of um, changes in antibodies as they age post acute infection. And, and the concept here of stickiness or avidity is being used to assess whether somebody has been recently infected. And um, here you see the design in the screening period. Anybody who tests positive undergoes the recency assay and is able to contribute to understanding the counterfactual placebo incidence alongside the trial as it unfolds. Similarly, the main study is using a same approach with the run-in recency assay, um, but here the primary outcome is, is Latrovir incidence versus background incidence. Secondary outcome is the comparison of the two active arms. Understanding whether lenacapavir, long-acting, very long-acting injectable, uh, also is going to be effective as a prevention modality. Again, the double-blind, double-dummy, and again, using a cross-sectional HIV incidence cohort to estimate background incidence. So again, here in the young woman and girl study, two primary endpoints, lenacapavir versus background HIV, FTAF, versus background HIV. So we will be able to know whether FTAF is, can be used for young women and girls. And in the men's study, again, the background HIV incidence is being assessed and will feed into a primary endpoint of lenacapavir versus background HIV with again, the two active arms. So we are uh, beyond the monthly is Latrovir and, and long-acting Lenacapavir will be moving into a very uh, exciting time of long-acting implants, multi-purpose vaginal rings, inserts, patches, enemas, long-acting vaginal rings, and of course, continuing with preventive vaccines and broadly neutralizing antibodies. And we will need to be thinking what the designs of the future are with our uh, strengthened standard of prevention. So standard of prevention now looking far richer than it did at a couple of decades ago. And this will, of course, be very important as we consider the designs of the future. And I again draw your attention to this wonderful series of workshops. They are available online. And there we, you see discussed concepts as bioequivalence, 
recruiting populations who choose a prevention modality, run-in designs, HIV incidents uh, being formulated through recency, counterfactual placebo arms alongside other trials, other counterfactual surrogates of HIV exposure, and of course, then bridging efficacy with correlates of protection, all very important as we consider humanity, which comes in many shapes and forms, and the need for prevention that similarly needs to come in many shapes and forms. There is still much work to be done in finding prevention that is accessible, affordable, easy, discreet, guilt-free, tailored, enhancing, and never distracting for all populations. It is then that we can expect better coverage and better coverage of all exposures, which will re lead to reduced transmission and reduced incidence. And this will require us to continue to innovate around how we design the efficacy trials. And with that, I thank you and many others.